I'm Tammy Vendonger, host for Executive with a Cause. Today on the show, I welcome Grant Dodwell, a co-founder and creative director of Australia Theatre Live. Grant is a triple recipient of the Logie for the most popular actor in Australia. He's best known for his roles on television soap operas, including an original cast member in A Country Practice, Willing and Abel, and Home and Away. Today, we're going to chat about the good, bad, and hard things about running a not-for-profit. Grant, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tammy. Pleasure to be here. A good friend of mine, Lexi Sakulis, is on your board of directors, and she is the one who provided this wonderful introduction. It's, it's lovely to meet you and to be able to go back in time and actually watch some of those shows that you were on. Yeah. Yes, uh, considerably younger there in those days. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and start with the the organization that you're now a part of, the Australia Theatre Live. For those people who are listening who don't know anything about it, can you please tell us more about the organization and also how you got involved? Uh, the organization Australian Theatre Live, we record live theatre, a live entertainment, but primarily live Australian theatre. So it's generally written by an Australian, performed by an Australian, designed All the creatives are Australian. And these particular productions can vary from a very small theatre, like the Griffin Theatre Company, a 110-seater, right up to the Sydney Theatre Company Drama Theatre, which is 700. So we vary as far as size and content. And then once we've filmed, we edit. There's a post-production process, and then we distribute. And we distribute from cinemas to art centres that have digital projection facilities. We have community halls, libraries, anywhere we can get theatre, film theatre, out into areas around Australia and indeed internationally. We're in the process of moving. We have two international distributors. So basically that's what Australian Theatre Live does. We film the live theatre and we have adjuncts to it as well. There might be a director interview. We might interview the designer. So it comes with a package of information around the particular Australian production. When you decided to start this organisation a number of years ago with your co-founders, what need were you feeling? What what need did you see in the community that wasn't being filled at that time? Yeah, great, great question. I, I guess if I a little bit of history about me as a younger actor, I did a lot of theatre and education. And in fact, I did a lot of uh, li- live shows. I was Schroeder and you were a good man, Charlie Brown. <laughs> and we toured Queensland, New South Wales. And I was just telling my colleague, uh, Sean, who works in marketing, that in the old days, we were billeted like a football team. So we would arrive in a small country town and someone would say, right, you and you, you're going out to this property, which is a 20-minute drive, a cattle station in the middle of Queensland. But they were part of the Arts Council. So what I guess I'm indicating is that there was a lot more actually physical live touring in those days. It it was a lot more economically viable. There was a lot more interest because of there's no Netflix. There was, it was very much one television channel and whatever live show came to town. So I was witness to the reaction we got in these towns. People were so pleased to see us. Some of them hadn't seen theatre before, and then once they saw us, became a theatre affectionarios. They they wanted to see more. The the experience of live theatre has an impact, as we know. It's a very old profession and still has that impact. So I understood what happens when it tours and the reaction we get. Now, we couldn't take the actors out live, but the technology had improved to the point where we can put up to 17 cameras over one performance, film it, edit it, and it's high quality, and we don't lose the theatricality. So we take that to all these little venues around around the country. When I was looking at your touring schedule recently, I, I noticed that these 
theater locations. They're not in the big cities. They're, they're in, there's a lot of them, but they're in places that, you know, may only have 10,000 people. Some of them are, mm-hmm. are bigger than that. Mm-hmm. When, when you distribute the, the shows to these locations, what, what's it like? What, what's, what's the actual event like? Right. It, depending on what the commitment of the individual accepting the film, let me give you an example. We had four films for the Sydney Festival. Now, the Sydney Festival, uh, for people who don't know, happens in January in Sydney, and it is a cultural festival. And we have international acts, local acts, from street theatre to mainstream theatre, to concerts, to opera. It is a potpourri of arts and entertainment, the Sydney Festival. We filmed four of those productions and we then took them on the road. And you're right, Tammy, we go to smaller towns. We go to towns where those particular individuals, A, maybe can't afford to come to Sydney, can't afford the ticket price, but now have the opportunity to see it uh, along with everyone else in the metro areas. So that... Um, process can take many shapes and forms. It can be a little small community hall in Tumut. This time what we did was added 10% of the gross would then go to a local medical centre. So a lot of the local councils came in on that. So we try as much as possible to make it a community event. However, sometimes it's on with Thor and you know, it's uh, all the big movies, Elvis, and then uh, suddenly you'll find that there's a, an opera that we've filmed that Australian Theatre Live has filmed. So in adventure, sometimes it's in a library, in a little town that has 800 people, and they have the projection facilities and everyone attends, um, it, you know, in that town. We may only have 10 to 15 people, but we're a not-for-profit. We need to get theatre out to the outlying reaches. I mean, we, we go right up to Queensland, to, to Charters Towers, right across to Margaret River, um, you know, so many little towns. And it required a lot of effort, of course. But, yeah, and on occasions, like next week, we have a children's show and it's called Prehistoric Picnic and it's by Earth Puppet Company and they have puppets, huge puppets, that, you know, one man or woman sits inside and operates the eyes and the mouth and all of that. Now, we're actually getting the puppeteers and the puppets down to a special screening for 200 school kids. So they'll watch the play uh, on film and then out will come the um, the puppets and the puppeteers for a, 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 an interactive session live. It's amazing to think that so many children and adults haven't been exposed to live theater because of the size or location of where their um, communities are. It's great that you're doing that. When, when you started a not-for-profit, though, around this specific goal of bringing theater to these regional locations, did you always have in mind that this was going to be a digital sharing of, of um theatre rather than a, than the old school of going from town to town in a physical form? Yeah, yes. I mean, if you look at the economics, um, it, it, was, it, was, it was just obvious. And the other thing too, Tammy, is I have a, um, a corporate actor production company as well. So we work within the corporate area, although I'm not sort of working in that area at the moment. Um, but we filmed... Um, a lot of drama-based training films. And so we understood the digital advancements, meaning that we can get high quality cinema quality with the cameras existing at a good price. So really the, the economics allowed us. And so in answer to the question, yes, it was always a, a choice of digital. Although we do produce live, we've already done one production where we produce the theatre ourselves. Okay. In the film. Well, I mean, the, the theatre, the, the live performance industry has been heavily hit by the COVID oh. lockdowns in Australia. Yeah. How... Yeah. 
because you were already digitally based, but obviously needed to film it at least once to be able to distribute it, how were you impacted as an organization during that time? You know, COVID, we were one of the only, I guess, industries that actually we had a spike. And it was simply because all the theatres were closed um, and the ABC, which in, in Australia is like a, a, a government-funded um, television station, which is national, approached us and asked for five of our productions. So this was a step up. As a not-for-profit, brand recognition, marketing funding is always difficult to manage. So the opportunity to screen our five of our films on a national television made a huge difference. So we were fortunate in that way. There was also a couple of government funded um, opportunities, government funding opportunities that revealed themselves due to COVID. Um, in other words, they were saying to production companies, if you had things planned and it's gone awry because of COVID, how can we help? How can we help financially for you to move on and and do what you intended to do artistically? So there were two benefits that came to us uh, during COVID. And quite honestly, Tammy, it was a good time for us to just to sit back a little um, because there was support from our, our government at that stage for organisations. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people tapped into it. Uh, to support your business as you are uh, during this particular time. Ha has that time of reflection and also time of opportunity, has it actually changed the way that you operate now? Yes. Um, and look, initially it was just the three of us and then the two of us uh, and then there was an extra. We have three uh, part-timers now and honestly since these younger much younger individuals um, Lucy, Emma and Sean who've come into the mix um, for three or two days a week it's made a huge difference. Um, now that came about through a reflection on we're working seven days a week we're, we're just 24-7 this is not good for the brain or the heart physically <laughs> and the soul. So we did expand and, in fact, we were, it came about through the government support that allowed us to expand. And um, as I said, with these three individuals that have joined us, we have moved ahead leaps and bounds. Um, they're, you know, these, these uh, Lucy and Emma and Sean are all under 30. They, they wear multitude of hats. Their thinking, their, their, their logic, their can do attitude has really made a huge difference uh, to Australian Theatre Live. And uh, we're really grateful for that. I, you know, it, it evolves. I mean, we weren't a not for profit to begin with. I might just clarify that. Um, but the more we ventured into philanthropy and foundations, we realised that we, we had to become a not-for-profit because sustainability was not happening and won't happen for some time. So the and organisation started with three of you, is that right, yep. as co-founders? And how did you get your initial funding? The initial funding was us. We funded um, our corporate um, sort of production company uh, actor based again theater based you know we we wrote mini plays and did them live in corporations i did it for levi strauss in san francisco bp and sardinia you know we, we did it and we had enough there to say well look this is our passion project this is where we're going so that that happened initially and then there was a government grant that helped us out because we slipped through the cracks um, in Australia, we have organisations that support film and theatre, Australia Council and Screen Australia. We don't fit those guidelines. Why is that? For Screen Australia, you have to film a script, not film an existing production. 
the fact that we use cinema cameras, we use cinema cinematographers, we do sound mixes, we do colour grading, we do everything you do required to put a film in the cinema, we still don't fit. Now we're working on that, but we still don't fit. The Australia Council then would say, oh, hang on, why don't they go to Screen Australia? Because they're filming it. So we're in this big gap. And that, honestly, it had nothing to do with the individuals in the organisations who thought our idea was fabulous. You know, bringing theatre out into the outer reaches and rural and regions, they loved it. It was fantastic. But let me have a look through the guidelines. Oh, no, we can't do it. So when Catalyst, which was a government um, uh, funding that came into place, we, we were perfect fit um, and indeed for future government funding. Now, we've had uh, philanthropic um, and foundation um, coming into the mix now, but that's, that's a whole, and that's why I say Lucy has been managing that area and doing a fantastic job, and we're learning so much in that area. It's always interesting when founders start charities or not-for-profits based on passion projects, right? Because unless you have a large bank account behind it, it's you have to find a way to make it sustainable. Yeah. So yeah. At the, originally you and your founders started the organization with your own money, which is obviously very generous just to think about it from that perspective, but not unusual. Now you had a little bit of government funding. What percentage of your funding is government versus philanthropic now? Oh, look, the percentage would be, it'd be 80% to 20%. Um, and maybe less. We've only just started um, the philanthropic and foundation road. Um, I'm continually learning. We, it, you know, that's a, it's a whole, you know, that's another, you know, five day workshop on um, philanthropy, um, which is based on relationship. Um, not, hey, we need this money. Can you give it to us? It's it is it's a whole area of integrity. Philanthropic and foundation is all about integrity, um, and integrity comes from understanding motivation, understanding heart and soul, and then the hard facts, the facts and figures, your your broadsheets, you know your Excel what you need, what your gaps are, what you're bringing to the nation, what you're bringing to the organisation. So we are sort of in the early stages of that. And it's a combination of brand recognition too. You know, the more you're seen, the more that a philanthropic organisation or a foundation will understand who you are. Oh, yes, I've seen you or I've heard about you. Um so we need to, in fact, increase that because the government funding ends and it ends, uh, you know, in another eight months and that's it. So we have a lot of work to do in order. Ticket sales, again, we're improving. Um, we're launching a subscription platform, a global subscription platform. And so our incoming is increasing. Um, but it, it's very reasonably priced because... You know, we're a not-for-profit. But, but the other major area is too is contracts. And for us, that that took about 18 months to get together. Act as equity, because we pay everybody, everyone gets paid. And that was part of our funding we initiative with the federal government. We said to them, we became custodians of their money and we shared that money. Sure, we paid ourselves a, a weekly wage in order to film the four productions for Sydney Festival. But most of that money was spent on cameramen. So, you know, we do, we expand up to 25 and then go back to, to five of us, you know, depending on how big the production is. Well, but that's I, a whole, yeah, sorry, I jump, jump subjects there. Oh, that's okay. So I'm curious because a lot of us are not familiar with how, um, how these, these theatre productions come together. Mm. The the actors that you have, I know in some places the actors are all volunteer 
um, actors. Are, are you saying that each actor in these shows are being paid properly? Yep. Okay. Everyone, we have an agreement with the union, with the actors' equity, um, and we have a, a sort of a writer's um, agreement, um, a production company, Sydney Theatre Company or Griffin Theatre Company, sign a, an agreement, all the creatives, the lighting designer, the sound designer, the costume designer, because they're all fully professional shows. And we realised that we needed to get all that in place in order for us to film. And it's one of the major um, hurdles. We always get over it. But depending on myths, rumours around detriment to having a, a digital production filmed as opposed to a live production, does it eat into the pie? Uh, what are the issues surrounding screening and digital production and then putting on a live production. All of those things we research. Most of the research comes from the UK um, and to an extent to the US. So, yes, we do. We pay. We pay all our cameramen their rates. We have to hire gear. Um, the edit process we do here, there's a little edit suite down the back there. And then we, we will, depending on the budget, send the sound to be mixed. Every actor is, is mic'd. So individuals, when we do an opera, every opera singer is mic'd and it's mixed into a 5.1 surround sound mix or a stereo mix. Our, our main aim is to get the best, highest quality we can. It's not a matter of just putting one, two cameras in one position. We have crane shots. We have... A multitude, but then we might go down to a, a company that is a, a very small company that doesn't have those funds, or we will then say, well, we have the funds. So then we reduce the production, we reduce the, the camera. So it is the pre-production and the processes needed to be put in place in order for us to film that production once it are massive. So, so questions, just because, once again, I'm not familiar with this industry as well as some of the other ones. What's the majority of your cost? Is it around the actual paying the actors? Is it around the actual production piece? Like, like as far as operational costs, how does that break down for you? Well, that, that's a, they're our major costs when we're shooting. Um, I would say, depending on the size of the cast, because, you know, if it's only two in the cast, well, obviously we have a payment of, I think it's about $800, $1,800 per, and that buys us streaming rights for a particular period of time. It buys us a television rights, um, VOD, uh, video on demand rights. So they're all broken down according to our agreement with equity. Um, cameramen have a set rate. Some of them go through agencies or not. Um, I would say sometimes when it's a big opera, uh, the costs might be equal to the crew and cast. Um, and then we might, depending on the mix, it might be sort of five to six, seven thousand dollars for the mix. And then for the color grade, it might be three and a half to four thousand. So we can vary each production from, say, minimal 36000 up to 110000 Okay. And do, uh, when you talk about equity, does that mean that every time the film is shown that every actor and, I guess, crew person gets a percentage of the theatre sales or the ticket sales during that time? Is that what that means? Yes, they do in the back end, but it's not immediate. It's not gross. So it... Uh, the writers get gross back end, which means it starts tumbling. But our agreement is that it reaches a certain level and then it tumbles out um, with a percentage split. The theatre company get a split as well. They get a 30% split. Our distribution company gets a split. So it's everyone gets a piece of the pie. Um, and uh, ultimately at this stage, sustainability is some way off. You'd have to have a great accountant <laughs> to do all yeah. this. Yeah, we do. That's the other member of our, Michelle, who's our, who's our accountant. 
Um, well, we have a, a company that, because with the government grants, we have to do complete audits. And in some cases, they have to have an independent audit as well. So bookkeeping is really, really part of it. But we believe with the launch, and it's all, it's a, it's progressive in the arts. It's, you know, I can see it because I listened to a few of your, the, the podcasts, and there's a, that um, one in particular about the sleep, the bus. A uh, sleep bus, yeah. Sleep bus. You know, what a fantastic idea. Now, it seemed to me, and maybe not so, but it was fairly, its timeline from the idea to fruition wasn't too long. Um, it, it, it happened. And, and a not-for-profit idea like that, it requires the hardware of a bus, the funding, the, the idea, the logistics, and oh, what a fantastic idea. With us, we're, we're moving within an arts industry that was deeply affected by COVID. Um, so the constants vary. And I think I, when I emailed you once, I said it's like satellites are flying around us and, you know, we're getting you know, the, the GPS on one and what not on the other. So we're continually learning and managing the, the the what's happening within the arts industry. We're primarily there to support live theatre. We know that research shows that more ticket sales, ticket sales increase. People who's never seen theatre will see a live film production in a small country town and go, oh, I love theatre. That's amazing. Was that one show? How do those actors learn all their lines? Wow, that, that was two hours right from the start to the beginning, nonstop. You know, because everyone's used to video where they're all little scenes thrown together. So, you know, this ancient profession is alive in a digital form, albeit in a digital form. But, yeah, going back to that. So, in other words, with Australian Theatre Live, we are we're on a, you know, I hate to use that word, but it's true, we're on a journey. Um, and ideas, opportunities arise. Meantime, we're building, continually building relationship. I think for any organisation, relationship is the key. It, you know, they use the word networking. Well, yeah, networking's there, but you've got to be, it's got to be based in integrity. It's got to have you know, the, the honesty, the laying things on the table, um, building that relationship. And that relationship, it might take years before anything happens, but that doesn't, that means it's not discarded. If you've got someone with a like mind who has similar ideas, but you may not see for eight months, in a not-for-profit, that's fine, because when you greet them the next time, it picks up from where it starts off. You know, you continue to update that individual. You continue to to join them in, not particularly asking for for whatever. You don't ask. You share. You know, be, yeah. I think it's a really interesting perspective to to think about that from a fundraising perspective. I mean, that that's essentially what you're talking about. When you mm. when when I talk to other charities and and from my own personal experience, even as um, like a bequest when people leave money in someone's will, we always said that's at least seven years from the time that they've made a decision to the time that you may, on average, um, see some some money exactly. from that. And, and that's if it's not contested. So yeah. it's, it is a long-term relationship. And you, as a, a fairly young organization that is still learning how to bring people who are passionate about the theater to into your circle of friends, I imagine that is taking it. Uh, it feels like it's taken a long time, but it, it is part of that journey. And most charities will tell you the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I um, sort of, you know, that passion is and tenacity are two of the the major ingredients. Uh, strategy uh, and logic, of course, play a role. But sometimes, especially for me, I can get very emotionally involved in a particular strategy, knowing that 
um, say, let's just use an example. There's a project that I know teachers would enjoy along with their students. And um, so I work for four months um, on doing the rights or getting a momentum around filming that particular project. And then on late on a Friday afternoon, I get the email saying, look, terribly sorry, I know you're going to be disappointed, but we're not going to go ahead. Um, you know, it, that, that passion then turns to, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they understand and all this. And, and that's good because it's indicating to you, I, you know, I did a lot of corporate work and around um, disempowering beliefs and empowering beliefs and I statements and with a, um, a woman called Margot Cairns and we travelled with a, she travelled with a troupe of actors and her, her message for business executives, for boards and for senior executives was your emotion is telling you something, what can you learn from it? And I think that's a, a major part too because disappointment can compound in a not-for-profit because what are they talking about? We're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing that. You know, <laughs> What's wrong with them? Um, and that when it compounds, it can lead to um, a fog and you're not strategizing, you're not you know, you're not developing it. So it's really having, and most people do, you have that insight into that, you know, that that's, and that's very personal. That's me. You know, I, um, I get this sort of um, weariness. I imagine because of the nature of your work, which is, it is very different from a lot of not-for-profits in the sense that it's very project-based, meaning that there's a start and stop date. But the other part of it, which you just explained, was the fact that you might invest a lot of time getting to that start point first and then trying to get the funding on the back end of that. I, mm -hmm. I think that that's probably really unique to your industry and in general, not just as a not-for-profit, that you might invest a lot of energy to get something off the ground before you might ever see a dime of funding in it. Do mm -hmm. you have a... I guess, portfolio of work that you always expect some things to get funded and things not. As an example, when I when I talk to, especially those in the social enterprise place, they're looking for investors. Investors typically would invest in so many projects knowing that so many may not be profitable at the end of it. Do you have a portfolio like that where you're constantly working on different projects at once with the idea that at least one of these is going to get funded? Yeah, that's true. Look, we, we are still on the tail end of the funding, the government funding, the RISE government funding. So the projects that we have in mind are funded, and uh, which is wonderful. However, there are particular other projects because we are, you're right, Tammy, we're juggling. We're juggling projects. So, you know, I spent four and a half months going for a particular play um, and wanted seeking permission to film. And that's before we looked at actors and creatives and various other things. That fell apart. So then it's plan B. What have we got? Um, <clears throat> now, with the more organisations have... And that landscape that I mentioned earlier around Screen Australia and other funding bodies that are specific to screen and specific to theatre are changing. There is there is a swing towards digital. And I think we're going to be in a really good position. And as you say, we would approach a company, like there's one company we're doing five productions, Griffin Theatre Company, all new Australian plays. Now we, we applied as a co-funding. So they applied Griffin and we were the um, co co applicants on that particular thing. Um, Queensland Theatre Company had a bucket of funding that they were able to contribute to what we do. So every project is very different, but very true. We work very hard on getting a project and then, then we'll have to source funding. Not so much the case now, but that certainly will be the case in the future. And so your intentions to go internationally with a subscriber list... 
it sounds like that's another funding source for you in the future. Are you targeting certain types of entities internationally that may be interested in this so that like are they are they corporates are they other government agencies are they schools like what does that look like for the business model uh, as as far as um, distribution and people clicking on it we are looking at institutions but at the moment we do have films on what's called digital theater plus which is a uk based organization that is specifically for schools that go to the us india New Zealand, Australia, and we will have our particular films on that platform. Um, Stage Player Plus is another one we have. Um, but personally, with this, our own platform, Australian Theatre Live subscriber platform, we will then target US institutions that are, that, that are doing drama. I mean, we, we, always, we do get hits from America, from um, more particularly LA, where there seems to be a bit of a word has passed around there that, you know, these Australian plays are really good, you know, check them out. Um, and we do get schools in Australia sort of booking 16, um, you know, they, they'll, get, they'll hire the film 16 times. So, but yes, in answer to the question, we will certainly be looking at a process. I know that Sean has in place this dam that's about to burst full of um, marketing and strategic and um, Google, of course, have a not-for-profit um, ad-based thing, which we've, which we've been, uh, um, they've, they've said yes to. It's quite complex. So, in fact, you've got to hire someone to, to work with it, to do it. Um, we've got um, tra little trailers. So there's there's a big push that's coming as about to happen. But you see, we, you know, I, it's funny, you know, the first time I went to America, I was a young actor and I thought, oh, it's all better over there. This country's hopeless, you know. And I went to America. I lived in LA. I lived in New York. I saw a lot of theatre. I attended classes over there. And I came back going, well, actually, we're exactly the same. You know, there's good and bad everywhere. And our best is as good as the US best. Um, so I came back reinvigorated on my trip to America and I started getting work left, right and centre. Um, so we believe that the quality and the standard that we have is ready for the niche market, always qualifying it by saying it is a niche market. It's really interesting, though, when normally we're thinking about dist distribution digitally, they always say that the benefit of doing that is that for every additional person that sees this, doesn't cost any more to distribute it. Now, in the case of when you're doing productions the way that you have it set up with equity, with the crew, the actors, the studios, you're actually, every time you show that show to somebody, you're actually having additional cost. It's not just a one-off like software. So yeah. so I'm, I'm curious for, right now you said it's about 80% government funding, it's 20% philanthropy. What percentage is commercial right now and how do you see that growing knowing that you do have a lot of costs associated with distribution? Yes, very good question. It's like Australian film in cinema. Um, the commercialization again is a long road. It, it, there's no immediate answer to jumping sales like a widget sale or a exp expanding. Um, it's brand recognition that is going to um, sort of move us forward. But at the moment, um, it's increasing, but you know, we, we may only get eight people attending a cinema, which is a loss for us, but we're a not-for-profit and we're building. So we've really got to keep that in mind that our costs are so minimal as far as an organisation. At this stage, that's it's passable. For sponsors, it's not good because they're looking at numbers. Some foundations are looking at numbers, but we're building numbers. But... Commercially, at the moment, if someone was looking at our books, they may turn to us and say, are you nuts? <laughs> you know? 
what, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, yeah, th th we don't think that way anymore because we know we can see the figures slowly climbing. I mean, last week in um, there's a Vimeo pay per view. I think it was 46 hits, 26. Now that's in one week. That's excellent for us. So there were 46 times they they hired out those films. 46 people in that one week. That, that's good for us. Now, once we expand, it will get better. I wish I had better news about the commerciality of what we're doing, but I don't. And we don't, at this stage, we believe and have faith in that it will, will grow. I, I spoke to, I, li I like to refer to Jim Lynch from Zelandia, who uh, built the conservation um, space in Wellington. And, and they had a, a very long plan, meaning it was centuries long plan for them to know that the, that's how long it was going to take them to realize their vision. You know that this is a long game as well. And financial sustainability is more important than ever. How long is your plan in terms of to build that brand, to build that distribution rights so that you can see it, so that the organization has a future? Look, we reckon at the closest three to five years, I think that's um, the figures that we've worked and numbers we've crunched and how incrementally it is, it is moving every year, plus the marketing and, and gaining awareness. Um, but we, you must, we mustn't, yeah, we mustn't forget that our primary aim is for people that can't, the people who are disabled, who have hearing issues, who who can't attend theatre for economic reasons, for distance reasons, and that happens. That's that's our vision. Sustainability is something we certainly need to get to, but along the way, it's not to lose why we're doing it. And when we get feedback from a little country town from someone who said, you know, I was enthralled, I just thought about those, that particular Australian Baroque Orchestra and Circa, you know, it, it'll stay with me for the rest of my life. You know, it, it, it's those, it's that, it, that's our, that's our motivator. And sustainability, of course, most people, you know, there are various people within even my little business. So Grant, but we've got, what are you talking about? You know, like we've got to move, we've got to move towards sustainability because that's what foundations and philanthropic organisations are looking for. And I know, we know that, but, you know, we are managing that um, as well. So there's always Excel sheets that arrive on my, e uh, my inbox that I go, Oh, right, okay, look at another Excel sheet with another projection. And we will, we get, we'll get there. Because tenacity. Uh, look, that's any startup, it, whether, it it's, whether it's commercial or not-for-profit, just yeah. trying to push through the hard times. And, you know, sure enough, the passion is what drives them, and obviously you as well. Grant, I'm conscious that we're, we're out of time. So if people want to get behind your organization and the work that you're trying to do, where should we send them? What what location should we send them to on the website? Well, Australian Theatre dot live. So Australian Theatre, one word. I'm just looking over to Sean. Australian Theatre dot live. That's it. Um, Sean's in fact working on doing the um, the uh, subscriber platform at the moment. But yeah, that will give you all the information you need. It'll show you our past work, some of our new work, um, and keep looking there. And of course, you can contact me at grant at australiantheatre.live. So one word, australiantheatre.live, and that's uh, where we'd love to hear from you. Any thoughts, any ideas? Um, where you'd like to, to see it. I mean, I get Northern Territory, small little schools that want uh, um, a way, Michael Gow's a way. Happens all the time. Schools and education is one area that we're concentrating on as well. 
Well, we'll make sure we put those into the show notes so that other people can find it if they can't remember at the time of their listening to the podcast. Grant, it was lovely to meet you. Thank you for sharing your story and the organization's history and, and where you're heading, recognizing it is a fairly young organization and it's in a difficult industry, an industry yeah. that is um, largely project-based, that right now is um, dependent on government funding, but has certainly individuals have been hit pretty hard during COVID. It's great yeah. that you've found some opportunity in that and hopefully that will continue to allow you to grow that brand both locally and internationally and to continue to do this great work of getting theater into homes that would not normally be able to access it any other way. So thank you for the work that you and your team do. Thank you for the opportunity, Tammy. Much appreciated. Hi, this is Tammy again. When I'm not doing podcasts, I'm helping not-for-profits with IT decisions. The question for this week's IT in plain English segment is, when should you invest in a CRM if you don't have one now? A CRM, or a customer relationship management system, is this generation's version of a digital Rolodex in its simplest form. In the more complex versions, it holds all the data about your stakeholders and every interaction you have with them, regardless of channel. It may seem like every not-for-profit should then have a CRM, but I still know plenty of organizations that are using Excel spreadsheets and their email list to do exactly what they need without one. So if it's possible to run your organization without a CRM, when is it time to invest in one? My answer is either when one, your processes are too burdensome, or two, your data is so limited that you can't execute your strategic plans and objectives effectively. This means that if you only have a few FTE, an investment in a CRM may not be necessary at this time. Having said that, I've seen some of the smallest organizations use a CRM so well that they can do so much more than the average charity of their size. But this does require a leader and staff that are willing to fully embrace this technology and to personally invest in learning how to use it to its full capability. So there you have it in plain English. If you have an IT question you want answered, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message. I just might answer it on the show. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave me a review. To all of you executives with a cause, the world is definitely a better place because of you. Thank you for what you and your teams do every day.